You're listening to the Live from the Caribbean podcast, the show that brings the stories of island people making a global impact with your host, Pauline Joseph. Terry Curra. Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. Coronavirus ain't <laughs> stopping this. <laughs> It's not going to stop it. <laughs> All right. So for those who have not been on LinkedIn, I mean, where are you? What have you been doing? Get yourself together. Search for the hashtag LinkedIn local Jamaica and you will see this individual. But I feel like I wouldn't do justice to introducing who she is. I feel like she needs to do this herself. So... Oh, you did you? not just put me on the spot like that. Oh my For God. those listening in who don't know who you are, which is clearly anybody outside of Jamaica <laughs> and soon to be, um, what, Barbados, Trinidad, Grenada, Singapore. Right. Anyway, let me not do this intro for you. Go on. <laughs> Um, hi everyone, thank you for having me Pauline. Um, I am your Jamaican girl. I am an, I'm an event host, I'm a mom, I'm a moderator. Uh, I am I'm just your girl next door. I, I speak from the heart, I'm a truth teller in everything that I say and do and I really just want to be the change that I, um, that I want, that I want to see. Okay, so what do you do? Who are you? What, and from a professional perspective, what do you do if somebody were to ask you? So from a professional standpoint, um, event hosting, um, TV hosting or media, a lot of people always see me in that space. Those are my two um, very cushiony okay. things. Those are, that's what I do professionally. Right. So where did this all start? Who, like, you know, what... You know, it you came out it, of thin air. So let's start. You know how I'm going, girls have pictures. <laughs> 1975. <laughs> Like, you need to picture this. <laughs> right. I I had absolutely no clue or desire or passion to get into media or hosting. I didn't even know, this is going to sound stupid, but I didn't know of it even being a career. Mm. In all honesty, from I was about four or five, I said, I want to be a veterinarian. My mom and my grandma, you know, I grew up seeing pets. They allowed me to bring in strays. Uh, I had a, a pet goat at some point in time. I had a pet pig um and they just they they fostered my love for animals and even at the age of eight i remember writing a, a letter to our governor general saying i'm going to you know create this space for stray animals and i'm going to take care of them and i remember him responding to me saying you know the world needs people like you and i can't wait to see you do that so my trajectory as far as i was concerned from i was about four or five was veterinary medicine dr do little that's what they called me in, in, in high school, I started um, volunteering at Jamaica Society for the mm -hmm. Prevention of and It was just, it was obvious. Mm -hmm. If anybody asked, what is Terry Carell going to be? Everybody who knew me would have said veterinarian. So it was only natural that I got the grades, got the scholarship, did the interview, crossed my fingers, went to Cuba, studied veterinary medicine for six years, did it in Spanish, it didn't matter, came home, and the vet board says, eek! Congrats, great to have you home, but we do not accredit students who study veterinary medicine in Cuba. And it was like the biggest slap in my face because all these years I had my blinkers on and I did not see anything to the left or to the right of me. This is what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. um, only studied the sciences, didn't have any fallback subjects. My mother looked at me and said, what are you going to do? We have no money, which is why you had a scholarship mm -hmm. in the first place. What are you going to do? Where are you going to go and study? And this is where I tell people all the time that sometimes the biggest disappointments, the biggest boofs, as we would say in the Caribbean, the biggest slaps in your face mm -hmm. when your back is against the wall, you start to dig deep and you start to realize there's so much more than, there's so much more that you can offer beside what you even saw for yourself. So Fast forward, people start telling me, you know, you have a nice voice. And I'm like, what does a nice voice sound like? My voice is just my voice. And people said, hey, your personality is that of a media person. You ever tried TV? And I just kind of said, okay, why, why not? Yeah. And literally, that is how my career started. I would host an event for free. A friend person asked me to host it. I'd do it. And then people would say, well, you did a great job. We would love for you to host another event. And then I went, so this is a thing okay and so that is where all that's where that rejection led to my redirection where i host 
I do pretty much anything that, that I, I can in media, mm. anything that people want me to do in media, I can do. And it has, extend, it has extended to hosting locally, regionally, as well as internationally. So let's step back a bit. When you say scholarship, how did you so, get to manage to get on a scholarship? So Cuba has always had a very good relationship with Jamaica, thank God. And over the years, and this is, this is spanning lots of years i've met students or persons older than myself who went to cuba 10 years before me 20 years before me and so because of this lovely relationship cuba offered a certain amount of scholarships to a certain number of careers and in my year two scholarships for veterinary medicine were available for myself and a guy named rory we both went to our interviews on the same day and when we saw each other in cuba that's when we said oh you so my year had a contingency of 112 Jamaicans. And this is where we meet Trinis, we meet Grenada. This is our first time really understanding other cultures within the region. Um, and it was a big melting pot. The Jamaican contingency is always the largest. We're the largest in terms of numbers. But that is where we really had an opportunity to do the strength in numbers as Caribbean people. Wow. So people knew just like how the Africans had their contingency, the Chinese had theirs. Even though we had our individual identities, we were Caribbean people. And you don't mess with Caribbean people. We're going to stick together. And so that's how I got the, the scholarship. I had no idea there was such a strong tie. Abs Even coming here, someone told me that there are a lot of Jamaicans who are from Cuba. Absolutely. Like there's a relationship there. Absolutely. So that's some of us, our first friendships yeah. with a Caribbean person was in Cuba wow. to the point where we even had our own independent celebration. So everyone knew Jamaica would have the Congress, Antigua, Grenada, Trinidad, the, the contingencies all came together and we supported each other's wow. um, independence days. Absolutely. So let's go even further back. So Girl, you dated me. <laughs> Girl. <laughs> we didn't say yeah. <laughs> we just say let's go back. So what... um. Where is the influence there is, uh, in terms of you have your mom, you grew up with your mom, Grandma. the siblings? What, Grandma. What? I'm okay. an only child. Okay. Which, depending on who you ask, is a great thing. Or they say <laughs> no one child is no child. Such disrespect. <laughs> um, I grew up in a matriarchal home. Mm. Grandma was mm. the head of the household. And Grandma, God bless her heart, when my mom just got her real big job as a flight attendant at Air Jamaica. My grandmother said she she would quit her job to stay home so that she could raise me. And in that period of time, in terms of that early childhood period, I remember my grandma putting me on the um, veranda to study, you know, using the abacus numbers and reading and writing. And I remember a particular neighbor passing and saying, you know, Mrs. Mrs. Scott, you know, you, you, you look like you're trying to raise a white, a white person. You know? What the? Yeah, man, the person passed and saw me using my knife and fork in between my, my teachings that she would give me. And the, the remark was pretty much like, you know, it's, it's like a, a white people thing you're trying to do. But she had a dream. Yeah. And she had a vision. And everything that she did and everything that I am is my grandma. My, I grew up to see my mother work hard, so I mm -hmm. knew what working hard looks like mm -hmm. and earning money looks like. But grandma was the one who instilled my core values. She's the one who carved me out mm -hmm. in this world, and I am who I am today because of her. And so I've never been um, fearful. Mm -hmm. Men do not intimidate me in any space because I do not know what patriarchy looks like. Mm -hmm. I did not experience patriarchy mm -hmm. in my home. If a light needed to be fixed, I fixed it. Mm -hmm. If I needed to go on the roof, I went on the roof. So, you know, I, I've heard people say, you know, men should be in the household, and I'm not here to dispute that. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's mm -hmm. a, that's a old, you know, argument that I'm not going to get into. But I can tell you that when I speak to my friends who did grow up in households with, with men, they have different perspectives and different personalities. So I grew up seeing women do everything. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing... And no reference point for me to think otherwise. It's interesting that this, there's a similar perspective of being white mm -hmm. because there's a saying we have is being an Oreo. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And for me, growing up in both Trinidad and Barbados, I always had to change my vernacular for people to understand me to the point where I spoke that 
anybody could understand me. Right. So a lot of people will say, but you don't have a Trinidad accent, right? right? And it's funny because Bajans see me and they're like, well, you're a Trini. You're a Trini. Right? So, uh, like, but I grew up with my mom and sometimes my dad mm-hmm. where it was important to read it was important to not come back speaking colloquial, which right. in general is an argument that that's people another have. Argument. Oh my god, <laughs> just like that's a whole argument on its own. But it's it's interesting that there's that culture of being educated is considered oh, being white. Absolutely, because anything that's better is being white. That's really what you're telling me. You are telling me that because I understand etiquette or that I'm learning etiquette, that means that it is out of my league, then somehow it has to be white. Therefore, it can't be me. That's essentially what you're telling me. And it does come back from the colonial days. Mm-hmm. But you see, my grandma said, you can say anything you want to say, which is the personality I have. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Your opinion about me is not my problem. Yeah what your view and and perspective is has nothing to do with me and so because i saw her practicing and preaching that Mm -hmm. that is just a part of my personality and i just it doesn't matter who you are or what role or title you have i am simply not intimidated because i don't know what that is like so do you think um because of that absence uh, of i guess a f- male figure because i can only imagine how this podcast is gonna blow up oh. <laughs> <laughs> sorry in <laughs> advance and this is so way off like my whole structure but that's fine because i appreciate these conversations do you think that intimidates the men in your life like how how does that affect you with that are we going to talk about dating (laughs) is this what this podcast is gonna be (laughs) all right so earlier i said that i'm the girl next door yeah right so i'm extremely approachable i think so and everybody says i am (laughs) however i do find that caribbean men and and there are many who are going to um disagree but if they really want to be honest, they'll, 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 they'll agree with me. Um, a lot of men will, will tell you, no, we're not intimidated by strong women. We want our women to be strong and educated and exposed and experienced. And we want them to know themselves. And it, it's an idea mm-hmm. that they love because a woman like that is, is a good woman to have on your arm. She's not flighty and doing all sorts of things. She, she knows what she's about and she's probably going to be the one to say, hey, I don't think that is wise and I don't think it's wise because of X, Y, Z. The idea sounds great until they actually confront it because it, it becomes a, well, I don't want you to challenge me. Like I want you to be smart, but not too smart, not smarter than me. Mm. I want you to be strong, but I don't want you to be stronger than me. And it isn't that um, I have a problem to yielding. I don't have a problem to, you know, yielding to a king once I've established that he's a king. But generally speaking, I find Caribbean men have a very hard time dealing with, with that person as a partner. And it becomes this power struggle. And compromise becomes conform. And it's usually for the woman. And nothing is harder than someone who's very strong and and very strong-willed and knows what she's about to know compromise to the point of conformation it becomes it becomes too difficult some of us become broken spirits and Mm -hmm. we just occupy the space you know to live a peaceful life Mm -hmm. and some of us realize we're not meant to be cage birds so um luckily Luckily, my partner understands me very well Mm -hmm. and he lights my flame rather than trying to out it. He does not see me as a competitor, but he is excited at my potential and he's there to say, yo, lick shot, you can do so much more. And I think that is who we need. Mm -hmm. We don't need people telling us, well, you know, you're, you're occupying too much space, small up yourself. And that's quite frankly what a lot of, um, men do so do you see this translating from a professional perspective because of that (laughs) oh this podcast is gonna be (laughs) lit because that that this is an ongoing argument i have with my female friends Mm -hmm. they have the opinion that we just need to keep on going knock on doors get it done break those seals yes which i agree with i'm never not going to be an entrepreneur but the recognition Mm -hmm. that there is this clearly misogynistic understanding of what it's like to be a professional and Mm -hmm. 
these are the people that are making the decisions. Mm -hmm. So I want to understand your point of view as it relates to where do you see that um, affecting your professional career? Right. Um, so, so oh God, God has God has been so good to me. He's covered me in so many different ways. So I've been able, I've been lucky and blessed. Maybe that's the word I'm looking for, to straddle the professional space without misogynistic um, uh, experiences. I've been blessed enough to have. I've had male bosses, mm -hmm. um, and to tell you the truth, I've I've been able. I don't know if this is my brand voice, my brand identity. Um, I don't know if it is what they saw, mm -hmm. but I think sometimes men are going to try to treat you a certain way, whether it's professionally or personally, based on their own exposure and experience, the fact that they're ignorant and they don't know any better. And some tend to see what they can get away with. Some test the waters. And what I've realized is that when they do come up against people who they realize that it just doesn't make any sense. Like, dude, it's not going to make any sense. You know what? They don't. They get down to what the business is about and they keep it moving. So my experience might be very different in comparison to other women, but my I never experienced, I never experienced that. Um, what I'll tell you is I've experienced um, persons maybe in the audience. So it's never been my boss or it's never been somebody who I've worked with or worked for. It will be a random person who might come up and say, um, Oh, you're so beautiful. And you go, thanks, you know, thank you. Thank you very much. Like, you know, you take the compliment. It's very nice of you. And you 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 don't register it, it mm -hmm. just goes off. And then it's like, yeah, you know, um, I couldn't help but look at you because you're so beautiful. And it's like, okay, cool. And then I, I might say something like, well, I also hope that, you know, the things that were actually coming out of my mouth resonated. Yeah, but you're like I've met maybe I've had two instances like that. But again, the moment they realize that it's not going to go anywhere, they stop. Because I will say, yeah, this is not working out. Have a good night. And that's it. Somebody needs to create a book for Caribbean men about what it means to have a conversation with a woman. Because I was told yesterday, uh -huh. you have nice skin. And it's like, okay, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. You know? And then it was a continuous conversation. He needed to identify why he had to identify my skin. Because I also, maybe I'm in a stage of feminism that people don't agree with, but you have to go the extreme to come back to some form of normality. Where it's like, why you have to point out something physical? Because it me? has worked forever. It has worked forever. Mm. And we played a part in that. Mm. And we play a part in that. Um, because we've been taught, whether subtly or not, directly or indirectly, we've been taught to not challenge. Mm. Be pleasant, be polite, <laughs> be personable. Mm -hmm. So we've had instances, and I'm sure if you ask women, they've had these awkward instances where men want to put their hand on your, the lower part of your back while passing you. You don't put your, your hand on the lower part of a man when you're passing him, but you want to do it to a woman. And guess what we do? We don't say anything. We kind of have an awkward smile. We kind of mm. try to shift politely because we do not want to offend, although we are the ones being offended. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So guess what happens? Over a period of time, they realize that they're getting away with it. So they're going to continue mm. to do it. And it's because, I mean, I, I'll be very honest, now more and more women are coming out. Mm -hmm. When you used to look at the Me Too movement, mm -hmm. you have men joking around saying, boy, you know, I'd hug you, but... I don't want you to say uh, sexual harassment. Well, it's good. Mm -hmm. It's good. Yes. And if you would rather keep your hands off, it means that your hands should not have been on me mm -hmm. in the first place. But when we start putting them in their place, that is when they might alter their behavior. Yeah. But then we also know that a lot of the time we're not at the top of the totem pole. And this is where the whole power, authority mm -hmm. and control comes in. 
if you if you decide that you're going to style him, as we would say. <laughs> What yes. does that mean for those who don't know what that means? Style mean, you know, if you tell them, if you put a man in his place mm -hmm. or if you put somebody in their place, right. they're going to take it as an offense. You're styling me. If that mm. person holds the power, the authority and the control, that person could fire you. You could lose your livelihood. And I think that's one of the reasons why women have stayed quiet as well. Stay polite. Keep it keep it okay because my job depends on it. Mm -hmm. My my professional, you know, life depends on it. Uh, but the more you become independent, yeah. the more you become your own brand, which is why I tell all women I cross, I don't care who you're working for. Make sure you also have your brand for yourself. Mm. So if somebody crosses you, disrespects you, offends you, or insults you in a manner that you know this is just, this cannot be repaired, when you leave that job, you leave with a name of your own. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be general manager. You could be the receptionist for all I care. Mm -hmm. And until we get a handle on that, it, it, it becomes a very, it becomes a, a dancing thing between who has the control and who doesn't. So what advice would you give somebody who feels like they can't, it's almost like they're feeling between a rock and a hard place it where is. you want to move from where you are, but you have your dependence. You know, you may be a mother of two, you mm -hmm. may be a single mother. Keep looking. And <laughs> you're in a really hard place job-wise. You want to move, but mm -hmm. you also don't see yourself building a brand. What would you tell that person? I, first of all, I'd ask them, why don't you see yourself building your brand? <laughs> so, so I just got a message from someone saying that there's a girl who hates her job. Her friend hates her job, mm -hmm. does not want to be at that job, has a brand, has a skill mm -hmm. that she could go off and do her own thing, but she's fearful. Yeah. And I'm sure it's fear of failure. That's yes. really what a lot of people. Yes. <laughs> and I just asked one thing. Uh, you know, I said, well, does she expect to keep on sitting down and complaining and expecting a different result? No. So if you're already telling yourself that you don't want to build a brand, mm -hmm. you can't build a brand, you won't build a brand, then what you're basically telling yourself is stay. Mm. and put up with whatever yeah don't complain about it because <laughs> you're not doing anything to change your circumstance yeah so what i would tell somebody is everybody's a brand before justin bieber and beyonce and all of these people were the names that they are now when you look back at where they're starting from they were nobodies mm -hmm. but that's a lie we're all brands but we are what we make ourselves so while you're in the job that you hate or you're in the job where your manager drives you crazy, or you're in a job where people are sabotaging you, and you know all of this, you build. You build. Mm. You're working on that resume, you know. You're continuing to do other interviews. Don't sit down, put all your eggs in this one basket when you know that you do not want to stay here. You have no intentions of staying here, but you have to show out. You have to do something for yourself. So when I was at the Gleaner, I was comfortable, mm -hmm. I was okay. But I was building my brand. Mm -hmm. I wasn't posting only about the Gleaner. I was posting things that I was passionate about. What's my personality? What's my independence of the Gleaner? Mm -hmm. That when I decided to leave, I had already cultivated a community. I already started showing people what my skills are. And I did it by using social media. It wasn't saying book me, but people were seeing me stand yeah. on my own outside of the company that I worked for. And then even I, with my large community, said, Jano, you know, I could step out and I could fail. But what if I step out and I actually succeed? Mm -hmm. I won't know the answer unless I do it. Did it two years ago. Never looked back. And I have no regrets. But I have to bet on myself. Nobody not going to do it for me. Yeah. That's some real um, Tony Robbins kind of shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean. I received that. <laughs> receive that i mean it's it's positive it's positive all right so we're talking nothing about business and professionals and men. <laughs> yeah boy Whew. what do you do for fun we, oh, you know i was going to say and women uh, women mm -hmm. you know because we have to talk about the women as well go on can't just talk about the men because they're not all bad guys no, and guys no. we love you we love you we do um for women um what i'm seeing more in the space are women who are collaborating mm -hmm. like what we're doing here we're, we're collaborating yeah so i think we need to kind of dispel the whole um idea the notion that women are just out to get you 
you know, because if we continue thinking like that, then literally, probably, you'll always be working by yourself for yourself. You know, it's funny you say that because we had an event I shared with you. Stop talking about my uterus. Um, a conversation about women in leadership, and I mean the title was obviously for shock factor, Hilarious. but Hilarious. it it was what it was, and that came up in in the audience mm-hmm. conversation because mm-hmm. she was very adamant. Um, one of the audience members said, "You know, women do look out for women." It's not true. I'm going to be very honest and tell you, growing up, I thought that. And because it, we're all fed the same thing. So it comes from some place that I'm not going to say right now where, but I did grow up with it being instilled in my head. And I was of that opinion. And I went through, I mean, growing up with four brothers too, you know, I was like, oh, I see men. Like, Boys they don't make like better me. friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Better exactly, people, better right? humans. And I'm going to be honest, like if it wasn't for women, when I was in hockey, when I moved back from Barbados to Trinidad after school, my parents had six children without a plan. So there were days that I didn't eat, right? Go parents. So, <laughs> so there were days that, you know, it was a struggle. And if it wasn't for the group of women in my hockey club, Absolutely. My brothers and sister and I would not eat. Absolutely. And they came and they knock at the door. I never ask. And they just, they hurried and whatever. And they kind of, you know, and from there, I understood that I just needed to find the right tribe. And the Absolutely. more I was open to the idea of collaborating with women. is the more you attracted them. The more it came in, you it know. To- and... We ourselves, I mean, I mean, I've had negative experiences with women. It, it happens across And you're going to have negative experiences with people because right. people are people. Exactly. So it's this perception, which is a Caribbean thing, I'm realizing. Well, maybe it's a black people thing because I'm seeing that shift in black women magic mm-hmm. and helping mm-hmm. each other. And I think we need to talk about it more. Yeah, for sure. And, 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 and the, my biggest supporters are women. Mm. And the biggest motivators and the ones who say, come on, you can do more, you can do are women but mm-hmm. you also have to be a supportive woman yes to attract that kind of tribe yes because if you're bitter and ah, yeah, yeah, yeah you're not going to be in the right spaces to identify the right people or to surround yourself with the right people no in the same breath if you are that woman mm-hmm. who you know you might be the only one at the table you guys know the table that i'm talking about you're at the table and you're the only woman. There's some women who revel in the fact that they are, in fact, the only woman at that table. Um, and, you know, it, all I'm saying is if you're good at what you do, if you are truly good at what you do, then it don't matter if them put you around 50 women. Mm-hmm. You are always going to hold your own. Yes. So don't be threatened mm-hmm. by that. You will realize that if you reach out and you pull another woman who you say can add value, it will only help to make you stand even stronger. You look even better. You pull other people with you. It's not cool being the only person there if mm-hmm. you're not pulling other people behind you. So if you are that woman, trust in your abilities. Trust in your competency and understand that if you're bringing in other people, make sure you're identifying good people who can do the work and bring them along on the journey because I promise you that journey will be so much nicer when you have a tribe mm-hmm. coming with you. And it's time for us to start making decisions. Men are already doing it for years. Let's let's get any mix. Collaborate. <laughs> no need for competition. Yeah. Collaborate. Exactly. So let's come off this heavy topic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And talk about Terry Carell for fun. What do you do for oh fun? God. What is it? Are oh you God. going to the beach? Are you going... Where? What do you do? I told you earlier that I was an introvert. And you were like, <laughs> shut up. You're not. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so... So for fun, um, I actually like um, being in. If I can... I, I'm usually either traveling the island, which I love to do. I'm a, I'm a total... Um, dryland tourists love finding and unearthing gems and hidden places in Jamaica that I can just totally get away from it because I'm usually connected. Mm. I'm always connected online. I'm always connected Mm -hmm. with my online community. I'm always hosting events with people around me. Um, And so what I tend to do is retreat. Mm. That's what I do for fun. 
and I usually um, I'm with my people know that my relationship with my daughter is very important to me. I'm very involved. So we can be found doing projects and painting and building things and just doing anything that will um, help to enhance our relationship. Um, the beach, the river, anything that has nature in there. I'm there. I'm more likely to go to a line with a few friends rather than a party. And I will definitely do stage shows. What's a stage show? What? Concerts. Oh, that's and true. Preferably, yeah, but we we'll call it stage show because, you know, we don't say live concert. We say stage show in Jamaica. So you will see me at Rebel Salute with my flag, my sizzler flag and oh, my cable tongue. Okay. That, that will, you will see me in a state of euphoria if you catch me at a, a live concert. For sure. So what is it? Because coming from, well, growing up in Barbados, everything was five minutes. <laughs> Living in Trinidad and I working from home, everything from the computer. So the idea of where I'm going tomorrow, which is Ochi. Nice. Can't say That's Ochi not too Rios, far. Ochi. And it's like an hour. Oh my goodness. I forget how big Jamaica is. Yeah. And that's close. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, you chose somewhere that's... <laughs> close you're not wearing the grill no at all at all say yes <laughs> what is the one thing you will tell a Caribbean person listening to this some place in Jamaica that you wouldn't necessarily see advertised from a tourist perspective where would they need to Portland okay Portland is the prettiest parish I come from St. Catherine big up all the other parishes <laughs> don't want to offend anybody but if you want to go where the the, 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 the foliage is absolutely lush and the water has a color mm. that you do not find anywhere else on this island. It's, the, it's, the, it's the, 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 the place where you go to get your Boston jerk, which you'll tell you is the best jerk in, in, in Jamaica. The Blue Lagoon where the famous movie was made. It's not a joke. When you look at Portland, you kind of feel like you've just walked into... A painting it, it can't be this perfect and it's because it's one of the most untouched mm -hmm. parishes if not the most untouched parish in Jamaica so when you go out there the water is beautiful you are rafting and everything is green right now the screensaver on my phone is actually from Blue Lagoon so I would say go to Portland and if you're staying over go to the canopy house tree houses in the canopy of the trees you can't see it. You can see the lagoon, but everyone who's on the lagoon cannot see you. There are no curtains, and you can see straight out into the trees. And it wow. is the most beautiful um, getaway place. And it is my favorite getaway place in Jamaica. Well, barring this coronavirus, I will. <laughs> I will. The Next food visit. is very good there, too. The food is very good there as well. So okay. I'd say Portland. All right, cool. So let's head back to professional Terry Kira, right? So let's go to, let's say somebody, <laughs> let's say somebody just found you on LinkedIn mm -hmm. um, and uh, they're inspired by you, want to become, you know, as clearly what happened like half an hour ago, because mm -hmm. <laughs> you have a lot of folks out there. Mm -hmm. What, um... What is, because you're now an entrepreneur, right? Yeah. You consider yeah. Standing on my own, yeah. Okay. Still working it out. Still learning, as you said, processes and things that you're kind of bumping and stumbling into. You're like, oh yeah, this is important, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. totally. So what are your learnings from a cash perspective? Like making money, being an entrepreneur... Like, what, how is that working for you? Because people see, they, they confuse likes for money. <laughs> <laughs> and they assume that, you know, my God, you must be rolling in it. Which right. is neither here nor there. It's like understanding that process that you're in right now. Right. I'm happy that you use the term process because a lot of people see the destination, but they don't see where the start line was. Mm -hmm. And they certainly don't understand how long you've been practicing for this one race. So, you know, they, I, I like to use the use same bold um, example where you know he bust up that race in 9.58 and he did it in the blink of an eye but let's talk about all the training all the early morning all the late night the gym work the the, the punches the doctor's visits the coaches when you think about all that he put into just that 9.58 seconds which is just the victory and everybody saw that mm -hmm. you really understand that being an entrepreneur being a being a professional whether you're working for yourself or you're working for someone it is not all about the victory it's not all about the the, the finish line but it's where you start and 
how you 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 trust that process so the things that i've learned most is that if you do not take your brand seriously mm. if you do not take your talent or your skill or your value or whatever it is you're bringing to the table seriously do not expect anybody else to do it for you if you are asked a question and you kind of say well me just i'm just trying something i have a little business you know me mm. I do a little thing <laughs> then understand yes. that people are going to say and treat your business like a like a team <laughs> and it doesn't matter if your business is in its first year third year or fifth year if this is what you know this is your industry and you're carving out a space in that industry then you have to step out with a level of confidence or nobody's gonna have the confidence mm -hmm. in you and those are things i realized when i step out and i do an event i know confidently i am going to deliver that event to the point that when i leave i'm probably already booking another event by the time i leave that um that 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 space and it's because whatever i exude is already speaking on my behalf so i think that is one of the biggest um um learnings or or teachings something else i've learned is um negotiation is always good when you start out when nobody knows who you are or when nobody knows what you are capable of you have to kind of foster relationships which means sometimes you can't go at the top of what you think you should be paid you kind of start low because you need to get your foot mm -hmm. in the door mm -hmm. here's the catch though there comes a point in time when you assess what you do now you assess what's the value of what you do now who are you servicing what industry are you servicing do you realize that now a certain level or caliber of persons are coming to you and entrusting you with a particular service then boo at some point in time the 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 one foot in one foot out I give you 50% off i give you 10% off maybe i do it for free those things go out the door your value and your cost are no longer up for negotiation unless that's what you want to do mm. and i think that is one of the biggest things because nobody teaches you how to do that mm -hmm. you don't want to discuss cost you don't know if the cost that you tell somebody oh god this is going to be a lot i really think i should charge them a but uh, they're going to come back with b and suppose them go with somebody else and maybe it's going we we will talk ourselves out of the cost that we really or the value that we really oh, yeah. we That's really true. bring and so i think at this point in time what needs to happen is you have to keep on assessing your business keep on assessing your service and then this is your cost it's either you can afford me or you cannot afford me some clients you'll have to walk away from and you have to be you have to understand within yourself that it's it's okay you can't win them all and will some people say you're too expensive maybe they will but if they give me the opportunity mm. and if they know what i've been doing they know that i will deliver and i think that is probably the biggest lesson i have learned on my own i think what's unique with you and this is me going into my marketing mode as well is <laughs> I mean, you could show this in your portfolio. You actually have a following. Mm -hmm. So your following is even of more value oh, to somebody sure. who hires you. Because not only are they getting your services, but they're getting Brand your equity, audience. For sure. Right? And I don't know if it's um, similar in your industry in, in Jamaica, but I feel like in the Caribbean, our businesses tend to hold on to information. Oh, God, yes. So we don't like to share, whereas you have these big businesses in the tech world sharing technology, mm -hmm. sharing information mm -hmm. for the betterment of the industry. Oh, sure. But we... like Building we, audiences and loyalty and communities. We, like for me, in my space, digital marketing across the Caribbean, mm -hmm. we tend to hold on to information. We tend to treat um, it like this thing that gives us some School. sort of <laughs> yeah. competitive advantage. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's suffering because you have all these hustlers who are being, being taken advantage of. And then you have the people who are charging a thousand percent more, but monopoly, right? So how is that in your space? Um, I think <laughs> my space as an, as a, as a personal brand, 
Um, I think I, I've seen things uh, do better. I think people share a lot of information. I think where you will see the holding, the withholding of information is when it comes to influencer marketing, where everyone recognizes who are the influencers in the space, but nobody wants to talk about, well, how much do you charge? Mm, so yes. you have some people who enter the space and now they're being approached by corporate Jamaica and they're just like, okay, so um, how much how much should I charge? You know, you, you just don't know. It's similar to when I entered into the event hosting space, I didn't have a point of reference. How much do I charge? So I started charging very low until I realized what my value was. And then I quickly mm -hmm. switched out. It's the same thing. So I think in influencer marketing, a lot of people hold on, in, you know, information in terms of what price they should negotiate. For me personally, I'm an open book. People ask me anything. I'll be very honest with them. So I'll have people send me messages saying, I'm, you know, I'm, I want to pitch something. I want to go to contract. Well, how much do you think I should charge? And I will ask them questions. Like I'm almost like a consultant, you know, I was about to say, you need to start. With yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's a lot. I get a lot of these questions. Girl, so, start away, shop at Regis. Right, so, you know, I do this. I do that. Mm -hmm. I have this. They want me to do this. I'm asking them for the scope. And I'm like, listen, mm. if they ask you for this much, they're actually going to really want you to do this much. Mm. So you have to plan with that contingency. Mm -hmm. So don't, don't charge them this amount and don't give yourself room. These are conversations that people don't readily have. And so I realize when I give information, people go off, it works out for them. They come back and they tell me, oh, it worked out. Great. Awesome. That person now becomes a, a huge part of my community. And never, and whenever they go and they speak about me, or if I'm in a, you know, they're in a room, they're going to speak of me highly. It does mm -hmm. not take anything mm -hmm. away. Yes. From me. I I can relate. My roommate always, he and I always have this conversation about what value, um, in terms of like giving things for free. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm so passionate about it. He's like, why you keep doing this? Like mm -hmm. people are not paying you. Mm -hmm. I was just like, I can't help it because if you ask me, I'm going to tell you and it I'm going to back. dissect everything. Cause it it's who back. I am, you it, know? It comes back though. I can tell you each time I have said, here, you give somebody the olive branch. I've always told people this, it comes back two times fold. Mm -hmm. So to every free information you give out, you get three more opportunities where you make money. Okay, great. You, you can't live in this world individualized and you have to realize that I am where I am because somebody gave me an opportunity. Yes. We all kind of have this idea that we're all self-made. Oh, mm, you know, I just lies. woke up like this. <laughs> I just made myself like this. It doesn't work that way. Every single person in this world who is anybody got an opportunity because somebody said, let me give you a boost. Let me, let me, let me, let me make you sit down in the room with these people. Mm. We all got assistance in some way, shape or form. So don't know when you get to a certain level, behave like you did this all on your own, which is why I believe in the power of giving back. You must give back and you must send that elevator back down. If it's even for one person, mm. if you can change a life with advice for one person, yo, you're already ahead. Yeah. Everybody got a, a, a boost or a bus from somebody else. So why you find it so hard to do it for somebody else? That's rubbish. So we're going to Caribbean now. We're we'll talking about the Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> Join me between there. We'll split in some ads. Um, so I always have this, I guess I grew up with the both seeing both islands and having, I have this dream that mm -hmm. my business will be purely in Caribbean culture, but it's not ready to pay me yet. So we, I'll get there. But from a CARICOM perspective, you understand this, you travel the different islands, you've seen um, the effects of, you know, jumping and experiencing somebody right around the corner and having that appreciation for it. Right. I feel like the word CARICOM is just like, <laughs> it's not really utilized as it should. So I have a question to put out from a hypothetical perspective. If you were head of CARICOM tomorrow. Well, damn, really? That's where you're going? This is like a Miss World question. <laughs> damn! When I wasn't you ready. You are correct and right. Oh, and Lord, right. let me shift in the seat. <laughs> go, go. If you were head of the CARICOM tomorrow, what would be the first thing you would implement? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, girl. Mm-hmm. You couldn't like email mm-hmm. me that question so I could have just gone and Googled some stuff. <laughs> nah, man. This is coming pure out of you experiencing what you've experienced. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing, and it's, it's probably going to sound so basic. I'm so sorry that I don't have some verbose um, answer. Uh, what I realize is that as much as we do have CARICOM, we still do not know each other. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Grenada. Oh my goodness, such a beautiful island. I saw so much, learned so much. The people were so sweet. You know, we passing through areas, people pushing them plate through the bus and saying, try this man, you like it? All right. And they're going in their kitchen, cooking more food to give it to you. And I'm just like, I didn't know this. I knew you were the spice, the spice island, whatever the spice island means. But I didn't know you were so nice. And I think all of us, as much as we, CARICOM kind of gives you this false sense of togetherness, I really don't feel it. I think everybody's in its own space. Um, we only seem to acknowledge our culture and we might acknowledge other cultures because we might have a friend or a boyfriend or a husband, you know, a partner that comes from a different island. Then, you know, we, we, you know, there's some sort of integration there. But other than that, we don't know each other. We do not appreciate or know each other. And so I don't know how I would make it happen but i would want there to be more meetings of the islands meaning not just uh you can work here and you can work here but for there to be a true understanding and appreciation for what each of us are as, as individual islands but how much better we could if we really decided to do this together other than that we don't know each other i know the islands based on my geography but we each island if you're too small i don't know you Trinidad, yeah, carnival. Outside of Trinidad, what do I know about Trinidad? I had to go to Trinidad to understand the beauty that is Trinidad and Tobago. Outside of that, I don't know Trinidad. Is Trinidad trying to understand me or know me? We're not. And I think that's the biggest um, problem we have. There is actually no togetherness. And I think sometimes the best way to solve a complex problem is to have a simple answer. You think so? I mean, I, I didn't give you that. No, the to me, that of what... I, I have so many layers to that and I completely agree. And that's why I keep pushing people to create content. Mm-hmm. Because in order for us to know each other, we need to see each other. We have to. And we don't... And I keep... Every time I have these conversations, because I've been privileged. Like, mm-hmm. at the time growing up, I didn't realize I was privileged because I was like, I've only been to Barbados when I was like... <laughs> When I was like eight and I was like, oh my God, this is so ridiculous. Yeah, and I, and I mean, even making a conscious decision. So for example, we are enamored with bigger countries. You know, in Jamaica, we say you have small foreign and you have big foreign. <laughs> so small foreign is when you come out of your country, but you're still in the air. Yeah, yeah. You know, at Florida. Florida yeah. too far. <laughs> but big foreign is like Europe, mm-hmm. Asia, and all these exotic places. And, you know, with the, the help of social media, people are seeing these other places that they yeah. want to be able to hashtag, you know, you wish you were me. But um, w- one of the conscious decisions I made was to love which is why i do a lot of traveling in my country Mm. because i cannot love small foreign or big foreign without loving my country first Mm -hmm. that's number one and then i said you know it is important for you to actually go and visit these islands your neighbors these are in fact your neighbors and at the end of the day everybody put us all in one bucket and we're all one caribbean Mm. so i have made a conscious effort now to actually visit the islands within my region so I can have a better appreciation for what each island um, has to offer in a, in a very unique way without having to compare to Jamaica. It's not a comparison thing, mm-hmm. but it's what do you also add to this, this, this pot that we're, that we're stirring, you know? And until we get to that level, the islands are just like any yeah. other country. We go, maybe we don't go, we don't care. Yeah. And I think that has to change. <sighs> One last question. <laughs> I, feel like I, I, I feel like I've asked. I feel like I've answered like three million questions. That's the purpose of a podcast. <laughs> yeah, this is true. Um, this is true. So one question, one last question. Um, how? What is the most impactful thing in your professional career that comes from your Jamaican upbringing? What is the most impactful thing that is to your career? 
that came from your upbringing in Jamaica? So my upbringing in Jamaica, and, and you know, Jamaicans say it a lot, we lick about with Talawa. You'll always hear us say it. We're small, mm -hmm. small in number, small in size, but we're loud. We're bold. We're proud. And no matter where you drop a Jamaican, because of the culture, the upbringing, um, we are going to dominate. It's just, it's, 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 sorry, not sorry. <laughs> That's just how we are. <laughs> but, 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 but what it is, it's, it's an ingrained self of, um, a, 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 an ingrained sense of self and who you are and what you can accomplish. And so my, up, my upbringing was, if you want it, it is yours. If you desire it, it will be yours. But you have to go work for it. But not no more than you. And that is something that we say as Jamaicans. Nobody and nothing is better or more than us. And I think professionally, I apply to everything that I do. So whether it is that I'm being asked to moderate the town hall meeting for the coronavirus with the, the Ministry of Health and Wellness, or whether I am moderating a digital marketing conference, or I'm doing tech, or I'm you know, moderating or hosting an event in London for 500 persons from 40 different countries, I will not be intimidated. I will not be overwhelmed. I am in this room and in this space because I am supposed to be. Think rationally, think logically, and do what you're here to do. Deliver and deliver with excellence. And that is what I do in my personal and my professional life because of my upbringing. That's it. We're good. Only <laughs> point is like, well, <laughs> well, okay. I mean, you can't end like better than that. So, Thank you. we're done. That was it. Thank you. Take care, guys. <laughs>